I think your light shines brighter than most people want you to know it does. Some people have the ability to kind of pull out good in people and to give you encouragement when they know you need it. The Urban Exodus podcast shares the wisdom, wit, and stories of those who decided to embark on the road less traveled to pursue their own interpretation of the good life. Small business owners, change makers, artists, farmers, and more working towards building a better future for themselves and their fellow citizens. The people I've met through this project give me energy and hope for a better future. May their inspirational words and practical advice embolden and guide you on your own journey. This podcast is for country dreamers, rural folk, and urban dwellers alike who want to feel more connected to the natural world and the purpose and choices in their lives. I'm Melissa Hessler. Welcome to the Urban Exodus. Urban Exodus is a labor of love and is only made possible by listener support. To support our programming, please consider making a listener contribution or joining our Patreon community for access to bonus features, rapid fire interviews, videos, and so much more. I'm excited to invite you to my conversation with Walter Brooks Jr. Walter is a serial entrepreneur and the owner and operator of Brooks Made Gourmet Foods, a clean label sauce and seasoning business located in Georgia. Walter grew up in a large family in Los Angeles and went through periods of food insecurity. As a young adult, he worked various service and hospitality jobs before deciding he was ready to take the leap and invest in himself and his own ideas. His entrepreneurial spirit has taken him far since those early days. He has built a successful automotive detailing business, a restaurant franchise, and most recently, Brooks Made Gourmet Foods. Walter is a self-taught businessman and chef. He's learned from mentorship, books, and from trial and error. In our conversation, we speak about the hurdles that he has overcome and the winding path that has led him to where he is today. He offers some really powerful advice and thoughts on ways to avoid the self-defeating thinking when it comes to starting your own business. This is an invaluable episode for anyone wanting to take a leap into building something on their own. I hope you absorb the value of his words, his perspective, and his generous spirit. This is a story about learning by doing, the power of mentorship, and how generosity and kindness can pave the way to prosperity. All right, so I am really excited to have on the podcast Walter Brooks Jr. Walter Brooks Jr. is the CEO and founder of Brooks Made Gourmet Foods. And I met you, Walter, when I was in Cotton Valley doing the first kind of round of shooting for the Urban Exodus documentary series. And you are actually the cousin of Maisha who was one of my features for that project. And we just were sitting on the curb and started talking. And I just was really moved by your story of entrepreneurship. And I think that you have a lot of wisdom to share about your journey and a lot of things that people who might be starting out their own business or wanting to start their own business I think that you could maybe through your own experiences, give them kind of the courage, the tools, or at least just share your journey in a way that might inspire other people to step out of their comfort zone. So I'm really excited to have you on the show. First off, I'd love for you to share a little bit of your personal backstory, where you grew up, kind of your early life and your journey to where you are now. I started off in, uh, well, in the 70s in South Central Los Angeles, our I guess that's more accurate city timeline for me, a city city kid growing up in a pretty rough environment. I have, you know, gang life and just just major distractions for a city for a young kid. And, you know, so that that process is something that um, was very difficult in that time growing up in L.A. in the, in the mid 70s or 80s at that point with the drug pandemic and so I, I, that was one period, and you know, we 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 end up, you know, moving uh, out of that environment eventually to the West Side, and 
going to different schools and and things like that. So it was pretty, uh, you know, constantly fluid for me because after my parents separated, that brought a lot of mobility to my life that I didn't know where I would be or what certainties or uncertainties would be out there. And so it was just really frightening, I guess. You know, I guess as a kid, you wouldn't want to use that word, but I guess it was like terrifying, really, just being hurled into nuances and not really having the navigation tools to really kind of put the words to those feelings. And you just kind of just rush through them a lot and hope for the best, you know. And so a lot of that childhood was moving around a lot and trying to get my bearings and figure out where I am and who I am in this big world and, you know, what my purpose is and and how do I fit in and all that good stuff that I think everyone uh, before me has done. But for us, you know, for me then, you know, it was just kind of a, you know, survival mode, if you will, in LA. And then eventually pushed me really from working for people because I felt like I didn't have the credentials people were asking for to work for them. And if I did work for them, they would use the latter, which is, well, you don't have the credentials I'm looking for because of this. And then so you're like, well, if I had a desire to work, then I couldn't work because I didn't have this. And if I, <laughs> so it was a it's a catch 22. Yeah. And I was like, you know, just, you know, HBO, help a brother out. I just want to work. Yeah. <laughs> just, wanna, just put me to work. So after having, I guess, a taste of a lot of that, I just kind of chose to always find solace and, 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 and finding things that I can do to make money. So I would just kind of, you know, hang out with folks that were skilled and they would say, you know, do this. And I would be like, oh, okay, that's easy. Cause you know, really good with my hands, working with my hands is kind of therapy for me and, and I just enjoy it. And so eventually that situation led me to Atlanta where I went to school for tourism and hospitality management, put my head down and focus and was in school for a little bit. And then once I got out of there, started doing a lot of hospitality work and built Marriott's different uh, crown, all different establishments for Carlton and picking up my honing my skills in the uh, hospitality sector. But uh, if they would have, it always would put me back to an entrepreneur because I would work and find out that working in a certain environment doesn't give me the flexibility I need to just kind of have that freedom to work and have that feel, feeling of, you know, accomplishment. And so I always would look for, you know, people would always ask me to do things and I'd be like, sure, sure, sure. But they would conflict with my work. So it would be, Hey, can you fix my car? Yep. I'll make that money. And then, you know, so a lot of it would come down to just me keep struggling with me having people like me to do something. And then I'm stuck in this nine to five that only gives me like, you know, a few dollars an hour and takes up 90% of my day. And so eventually I just said, I came up with a little math and I said, well, if I could take 50% of my time and put it into this shoe and I can take 50% less of that time in this guy's shoe, I'll make, if I can make half my income over here, I'll take my other foot and put it over there with me. So it was a way to step away without cutting my throat. It was like, okay, well, I'll take, if I can make half the money I'm making working for this guy, then it then that gives my attention 100% to that other side. Because then I'll make 100% if I focus on that. But I had to have a bridge. And so that's always what I told people when I was like leaving something. I said, well, just make your other job, business a job, not a job, but a business. And then also when that can derive half the income you're making, then it makes sense to quit. That's such good advice, that idea of a bridge, because I think that a lot of people, you know, even if they're wanting to leave a city environment too, there's that real fear of like, how do I even start this? Because I have like this thing that's like a warm, protective safety net of a job. And how do I step my foot out of that? And I love your approach. That's wonderful. That's correct. And and that's where where a lot of people kind of uh, get hung up. You know, I wish I could, but and then I, I have to have my insurance and, but if I don't have this, then, so it's always an if then kind of a situation. Whereas entrepreneurism is like, entrepreneurism is like, okay, being an entrepreneur is like jump in the water. You don't get to tippy toe into the water. I mean, not the the bridge isn't there. You need the bridge, but you also have to have the guts to jump because you can always, you know, if your situation isn't going to scare you, if it's not going to be enough resistance, then you won't change. If you can't overcome the resistance, then you'll just stay where you are. 
So it has to be something behind you that's so painful that you have to take your first step. Were you born with your entrepreneurial spirit, do you think? Or was it something that you unearthed later on? I know that you had this kind of life-changing event that made you decide to change course and pursue your dreams. I'd love for you to talk a little bit about that experience and how maybe that was the catalyst to embold you to go on this journey. Yeah, I think that's an interesting question because I've tossed with that one a little bit. And if I look back down memory lane, my dad used to actually make these really nice custom in California. He'd take the palm tree leaves that fall, had fallen off the, the, um, the trees, and he would actually carve those into like African masks because they're like trunks, right? They're like this wood piece of wood, like a driftwood, and it would fall down and he would just kind of etch it out. You know, he was very artistic that way. And so one day I picked one up, a few of them, and I said, man, you know, I'm hungry. <laughs> so I said, I wonder if I could sell one of these. And so I just went door to door. And so someone bought one. And I was like, cool. <laughs> I mean, that was hard. <laughs> you know, how much do you want? I was like, nah, I don't know, like a couple of dollars. I don't know what the going rate is, but someone thought it was really nice and, and bought it from me. So I think I look at that moment and I skip forward and I go, I think I've always, you know, I've always had entrepreneurs around me. So as I said, when I was saying, I take these pockets and, you know, my godfather was a businessman, entrepreneur and automotive. And then my grandfather was a, he couldn't even spell his name without using an X that's you know, but he can go open his establishments all over Metro City of Los Angeles because he knew his business. His business, he opened five different appliance stores and so, but didn't have an education. You know what I mean? So I've, I've gotten so much from the different backgrounds of folks that I think I kind of wove a canvas out of it and eventually said, okay, well, you know, if they can do it, I can do it. You know, and if I can't do it, I'll fake it till I make it. I think that entrepreneur side came from all of those shoulders that I'm walking on and and mentors in business that kind of, you know, really kind of gave me, you know, the tools to kind of feel confident to do it. But at the same time, like I said, for me as an entrepreneur, it was always I'm good with talking to people. I don't know. And kind of mixing it up with new people. And it's like I'm not a, I'll just poke around. And then, and people will give me nuggets or jewels, you know? And so I'll be at, um, I think it was, uh, I guess, all these little nuances. So I had this one guy at a security company tell me, he said, why are you working here? And I said, well, you know, I need the money. And so he asked me again, he said, why are you working here? And I was like, okay, so am I, did you catch me sleeping on the job? Is there, well, you know, something I don't know, you know, it's like, you know, am I fired? And you just try to, you know, I, so I'm just sitting there like, really? And so finally he was like, why are you working here? I'm like, I'm fed up now. So he, he catches that and, and goes into this explanation. And goes, he said, I'm old. You're not. This job could be done by anyone, anyone, anytime. And if I was your age, this is the last place I would be because you're too young to sit around here doing a job anyone can do. You need to get out there and you need to push, run, fall down and get up. And you can do that as many times as you can when you're young. But this job will always be here. And I was like, wow. The fact that he took the time to even tell me that was was like, okay. I mean, wow. You know, that was a teachable moment. So I was like, man, I'm out of here. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, that was the last time I worked at that job. <laughs> so it was like, you know, then a the lady at a bus stop and she'll be like, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, I'm doing security again in Atlanta. And they're like, well, I'm going to run my own business. She says, you're going to be successful, you know, because it's all about service. It's all about making people do what you say you're going to do when you say you're going to do it. And, and then, you know, and, and that's it. And you'll be better than the next guy. So you're going to be successful. And I was like, huh, I like that too. So I'm out of that job. So, so just a series of, you know, moments where I think, you know, guys just tapping, you know, yeah, you know, not for you, not for you, not for you. The breadcrumbs like of wisdom that you picked up along the way and actually absorbed those breadcrumbs. Right. And they're gifts that, you know, unwraps, you know. So, you know, just seeing a motor under a hood at a kid and you go, OK, so now I'm in my 20s and I'm going to run an automotive shop. Well, that's, I didn't go to school for that. Well, I'm going to open an automotive shop. <laughs> so I did. 
<laughs> and so I opened up many automotive shops and and started working on cars and digesting the books and learning whatever I needed to learn and doing my research, you know, like a doctor, you got to read all this paper every day and the missions and so forth and so on. And so you just kind of get immersed in it. And so I think that really is what drove me as an entrepreneur is, is a culmination of just having the desire really to have my own thing. And so my whole thing was always to get myself out here and, and learn and prove to myself that if I can do it, then I'll do it. If I won't, I won't. It's almost like you had these guides all planted all along the way. You know, I think it's that in you as a person, I think your light shines brighter than most people want you to know it does. You know, and I think those people see, some people have the ability to kind of pull out good in people and to give you encouragement when they, they know you need it more than you know you need it. And so they, they kind of feed you, you know, and it's like you're constantly looking to get fed and it's like only a few people can see it. And then they give you the encouragement. You're like, wow, that was, that was so cool. You know, and it's like, so I think, yeah, I think those definitely those moments where there's an encouragement came from folks. You know, I always believe that I have one thing I can sell and that's that's who I am, my trust, me, who I am. That's my currency. And I think that working for yourself is, it's different because you get to like fine tune the radio for what the fit is. And I know that you have worked in a lot of different things. You've built a lot of different businesses at this point, and now you are in food. And I'm wondering your connection to food, like where your passion for food came from and why you decided to kind of change course and move into the food space. Well, food is always, for me, comforting, for, for one. Food, food is like, I'm a foodie. So I used to always run to the corner store when I found coins and I would buy a sweet potato pie. I, 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 like, I would have to have the sweet potato pie. And I'm a silly kid, right? But it's funny how like DNA works and things like that, right? Because as a kid, like, I didn't know my dad was really from the South, right? You know, I didn't know, because you don't know these things, but then it's like, okay, well, I love sweet potato pie. I don't know why. I just love it, you know? And I thought I was like the greatest thing in the world as a kid. You know, the smell of it, the aroma of it, you know, and it was nice little tart. And I was like, oh man, it was a rat. I was like, oh, I have to go get this pie, you know? So I always spent my last 50 cents or whatever it was when I was a kid to buy that little pie. So, you know, I always enjoyed food, good food. And, you know, I think a lot of it came with, you know, I had to go buy that pie because we didn't have those at home. We didn't have much at home. We didn't have a lot of food at home. So when I said to get coins, it was like, you know, I stole 50 cents or I, I was scoured for 50 cents or, I, you know, I got lucky and got some money. But whatever it was, it was like, you know, it was always I felt like I had to get the best meal I can get for my money, you know, if I was going to eat. And so I really enjoyed food from that perspective. And so I always try to, I remember everyone, you know, can cook good meals. I, I always can remember good flavors of things because it was kind of really far and in between. So, you know, I didn't have, you know, proper nu nutrition when I was growing up. I didn't have, you know, all your meals every day and everything put in front of you. So you go to school and your neurons are firing. And so, you know, you have teachers, you're not paying attention or this and that, but, you know, you didn't know as a kid, well, how could you, or if you don't have glasses or you don't have food or you don't have these things and you don't get sleep or you don't have the proper books. And so a lot of that insecurity came, I think for me, food was one of those little gems that I always really, really appreciate, but I always wanted to explore, but I just didn't have any or didn't have enough of it. So it just never it was, it was, I think for me, it was one of those untouched areas that wasn't scarred by you can't or won't or don't or anything like that. So for me, it wasn't a bad taste in my mouth when I thought about doing it because I was like, well, I love to do things. And so once I started cooking, People would say, well, man, you need to do this for a living. Like, this is really good. And I'm like, hmm, okay. So I'm on to something here again. So then I just, I just started doing more and more and more cooking, more and more exposure to clients and corporate. And next thing you know, I started a, a catering company. And I said, well, 
at least this will let people get the chance to try my food, but I have a full-time restaurant. Eventually that started taking off and I was catering for the Board of Education, Georgia Power and Weather Channel, all the big companies because I've worked on their cars. And so eventually more and more people would look to me for cooking and I would just really kind of delve more and more and more into it again. So I took my foot out of automotive and placed it in food and just started doing cooking. And then I stopped doing automotive and started cooking full time. My passion turned into a restaurant to let people now try my food because at that point I was like into another endeavor, which is creating a product as intellectual property, which is my sauces, rubs, and and creating a food company. So my wife and I would take these drives to the farm to produce in our production mode. And these ideas would start rolling out. And we were like, you know, okay, I need a food company because I don't want to go to a food show as a restaurant. So eventually I trademarked my food company, Brooks Made Foods, and then franchise the barbecue chain and then said, okay, cool. So now they're separate. Nobody comes here trying to learn how to make barbecue sauce. And I get to keep my products going to the food show and eventually created those two, Starbecue House, Starbecue, and called the Starbecue of Barbecue. And then we had Brooks Made Gourmet Foods. And so I was able to use the restaurant to help feed. You know, I always did it before I started the restaurant or during the restaurant. So I would always feed the homeless every Christmas morning. My whole family, before they opened gifts, we were feeding the homeless. And I have it for decades. So we would bring other families in and other church groups, and they would caravan with us downtown. And we would pop up these big grills and feed hundreds of people, just like the food at my restaurant. And my kids would be able to see that, you know, folks and see how, you know, life isn't always, you know, easy, rosy or whatever. And then they'd go home with the hope that they'd be more aware, you know, just a minute ago, a guy was on the street homeless, thanking him for bringing a meal. So it it just, you know, as a parent, you just want to give them some foundation because we raise them better than we probably were, or we like to think so. But at the end of the day, it's like, we just want the best for them. So they got to see that for about 10 years before they started going off into getting a little bit older and doing stuff that they do. So I always wanted to give back. I did that to the high schools. I do it for the homeless. I'll do it for cystic fibrosis. I'm a board member. I help them generate money and different organizations and things like that just to give back. I guess I came from such humble beginnings that it's easier for me, I guess, to understand that there's always, you know, some kids staring at TV hungry, looking at a pork chop going, I wish that was mine. (laughs) So so it's it's, it's good. It's, it's, It's kind of a just knowing that that community is there and you're able to give someone something just like I needed it and and I didn't ask for it, but somebody gave it to me. And that's that community aspect that's missing. And, and you know, because people never tell you they're hurting. They never say, hey, I'm hungry. Or, hey, um, you know, I'm starving. Hey, you know, I wish I was in school today. Or, hey, I, you know, that's kind of a taboo. You're supposed to like eat it, just shut up and stay, you know, just deal with it, right? So... I don't know. I think those experiences always humble me. And so that's why I try to do as much as I can. So you clearly have such an amazing grasp on how to build and grow a business. And a lot of this is self-taught, obviously. You know, you you, you self-taught yourself how to cook cover to cover. You self-taught yourself in the auto industry. And I think that there are a lot of educational barriers, obviously, out there still to this day. Food barriers. There are just so many barriers out there. What advice would you give to someone who, like, maybe they didn't go to college. Maybe they didn't have that access. Maybe they didn't even graduate from high school. And they love something so much and they want to go into it on, is it just like study, put your head down and and figure it out? I'm going to say it's for me, uh, I love this movie. uh, What is it? Slumdog Millionaire. Like I just love that movie. You know, it, it was always about you can know everything and nothing at all. It only is, it's only about experiences, right? So it's like, you can be successful because you have these pockets of information or pockets of wisdom and, whatever it could be. But if it's not in you, if it's not something that drives, you know, drives you, it's hard, you know, I guess to your question, you have to want to do what you want to do. It has to be something that drives you too. You can't just 
I'm going to do this. Or, um, you know what I mean? It's, you can, but then it's not. A, and you can't turn all your passions into a business, right? It's not an easy answer. It's, a, it's an easy question, but it's a hard answer for it. Because a lot of times, it's just where do you vet your passion? How do you know? Because passion could be a double-edged sword. You know, passion will have you not listen to people. You, know, you can be so passionate that you can't tell me nothing. <laughs> I mean, and if you're that passionate about something, then yeah, we can't. And then you'll fail. But then we knew that because you wouldn't listen to anyone. So my thing about that is that person has to be vetted in a certain way that A, it can make money to sustain you, right? Because you can like something that is a hobby and you won't get paid. So you can't just like something for the purpose of wanting to be on tour. You have to actually have a purpose, which is to pay your bills, you know, do things like that. So there has to be a means to the end. My advice in, is to, to get information and really sit down with a professional just, just to challenge you, just to challenge you to say, hey, OK, let's poke some so what's into this idea you're talking about. Right. Because you got to withstand the so what's. Right. Because there's everybody want to do what you want to do. So what? You know, I'm going to do walk dogs. Well, there's a dog walker over there. So what? You yeah. know, <laughs> so you, you really got to push back. I mean, you, you can't just be like you get shot down and just walk away because somebody said, so what? Like, I'm not going to, you know, you got to argue your case. You got to make a make a way for yourself and differentiate yourself or invent yourself. Or Sarah Blakely, she did Spanx when there was already pantyhose. They, you know, everybody told her, hey, you're going to do crap. I mean, what are you going to do? Give somebody new pantyhose? It's, we already got pantyhose. But, okay, well, the hell, I'm not telling you all nothing else. I'm moving forward. And I'm not going to tell my family nothing. Because sometimes, that's what I tell you before, the ones that are bringing you down is the ones around you. Because as soon as you start to do something, some positive, I don't care if it's working out. I don't care if it's a new job. Somebody's going to be like, the weird thing about that is the laws of attraction have it is that someone's going to be like, you can't do it. Or who do you think you are? Or what? The naysayers. You, but I'm only trying to do what's best for me. Like, why? Are, I'm not even offending you. Like, why are you so all up into me with this negativity? But it's just how it works. As soon as you start doing something positive for yourself, watch out. Just watch out. It's coming. You know, and you don't know where it's going to come from. In most cases, if you're not prepared, it'd be your best friend or family. And you'd be like, whoa, what the hell? So you're supposed to be my ace corner, you know, and so my rock. And it's like, you're just saying now, you know, can't build off of that. So, you know, there's places like SBDC, you know, Small Business Development Council, as free as tax dollars. They're smart. You know, they're in pretty much every every city. They're, they're not obviously Georgia, but there'll be another title for it, but it's a small business development council. And so, you know, you can go there and they will help you create a business plan. They will help you to do banking relationships, statistical data, the, the, you know, they'll, they'll navigate you through the reality of it. And that could be why you have a full-time job. You know, there's so much information, you know, in this 20, first century. And so at the end of the day, it's like, just learn from who fell before you. You don't have to fall again. You have to like prepare yourself with all of the answers to all of the questions ahead of time. And that's what that process is, right? I know that mentorship has been a key component in your success. And I'd love for you to talk about the people who have guided you and help you realize your potential. The thing about it is I didn't go out looking for a mentor. I didn't say, I need a mentor. And then I was like, that solved everything. You know, because if I, if I knew I needed a mentor, that's what I would have done. But to, to pivot, I didn't. I, I, just, I just kept working hard. And, and if I can give that advice now and say, yes, find a mentor. I don't care what stage you are and where you are and what stage of your business or what stage you are in your life. You always need a mentor. You always need a mentor. A mentor is someone who can tell you what you don't want to hear. It's like a parent. Your friends tell you what you want to hear. I tell you what you need to hear. I'm not here to tell you what you, you know, fluff you. you know, oh, yeah, you're right. No, you're wrong. You know what I mean? You're wrong. And that kind of power really kind of humbles you because if you value that person, then you go, 
I'm gonna eat some pie here and I'm gonna I'm gonna take it that he probably knows what he's talking about. But it's safe. It's safe, you know, because it's not some, you know, someone in your ear who doesn't mean you well. It's a chance for you to have someone that you can tell really how you feel, you know, or and and this and it's the best therapy because 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 then you really can say, okay, you know, this person does this and this person does that, but different people bring a lot to the table. That's what happened to me. They were all mentors, but they were, they weren't, I didn't call them mentors, but it's accountability you have to be ready for because you just, depending on your mentoring situation, they're busy. They're busy professionals. They, 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 they don't have time to dilly dally. They don't have time to say, I'll waste a day with you, or I have a work assignment for you. And matter of fact, if, if I was to say anything, even the greatest mentors, if they don't have an assignment for you, then they're mentoring you, but you're really not getting specifically what you should be getting out of that mentor. And while you might like the person, you you may not be getting what you need either. So, th- so, so you really need to say, hey, well, let me Google what I should get out of my mentor. And maybe I should Google what my mentor should be trying to get out of me. So in any ways, you have to do your homework. Right. And so you have to make sure that it's a viable working relationship and it's not a time waster. Right. Because I might feel good about giving you advice, but I'm not good at giving you a lot of advice for a long time. You know what I mean? So it's about getting the most out of a short period of time with your mentor and be concise. I just wanted to give an enormous thank you to all of the listeners who have made contributions towards the production of this podcast. Every season, I spend about 100 hours preparing, writing, editing, interviewing, sketching, distributing, and I have hard costs for my editor and hosting fees. It means so much to me that you find enough value and meaning in this work to pledge your support to keep it going. If you haven't had a chance to contribute, we've made it really easy. Just click the support button on the top of urbanexodus.com and pledge any amount that you like. Or join the Urban Exodus Patreon community. Thank you again. I feel so lucky to be a part of the amazing global community that this project has manifested. I think it's interesting, like the mentorship world, because it's a term that's used a lot in the collegiate, like university world. And I didn't go to school for business or anything like that. And it really hasn't been, I mean, I'm turning 40 in March. Like I just kind of established my first, like what I would call like a real mentor relationship. And it was something that I forged. And it was something that I realized just like you, like these people were helping me because they saw like potential there. And they also saw that I didn't necessarily have all the tools that I needed to get to the path. And so, you know, a lot of people listening to this podcast are people who are living in rural areas. Maybe they have farm-based businesses. Maybe they have things that they make or stuff that they want to get out there. Just that acknowledgement of like thinking about who's in your court and who's provided that advice, you know, and maybe also who is out there that is doing something at the scale that you want to do right? That maybe also has those things and just recognizing that relationship and really respecting it. Like you said, like being like, Hey, I really appreciate what you've given me and let me prepare all of these things. And could we make this more kind of official where like I, we set up meetings maybe like quarterly or something and I have an action item list and you do your homework. So there's that mutual respect. Yeah. Cause you want to receive them right? You don't want to devalue. You don't want them to think that you take them for granted. Mentors like to feel somewhat, you know, like I'm doing something, right? And so it's like, if I see you just in the same position over and over and over, it's like something isn't working, right? And, you know, it's like, is it me or you? And it's probably you. I'm already somewhere. But I would say the advice is to find a mentor to definitely do a lot of your own learning, as we we said, do some research on your end, you know, know your business, you know, find out where you fit. Don't try to be everything to everyone. You know, I know that's the hustle. And it's like, you know, 
yeah, you need that. Sure. And yeah, that too. And I'll get paid for it. Yeah. And this, yeah. And sure. Yeah. And you're like, a tra- you're just taking, you're just taking it from any, but you're like, my grandfather would say, Godfather said best. He said, always told me, don't be like the squirrel because you're just tree to tree. And when someone wants to know who you are, no one knows what to tell people. You just can't be anywhere, everywhere, all the time doing stuff because no one will respect you. And that's one of the wisdoms that made me slow down and realize I need to specialize. Well, that'll also burn you out, right? And oh, I- yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, see, it, it burns you out in two ways. One, you never know where you're supposed to be. And two, when your real client that you didn't know you asked for calls you, you're never available. And then you realize this is happening. I'm like, I'm sitting here doing a $50 job and somebody just called me for a $5,000 job <laughs> and I can't get off this $50 job. Yeah. And I'm just like, what the heck am I doing here? And I just felt so devalued. I was like, man, I, I cultivated a client that I'm not there for. And I cultivated a client here who thinks that I should be giving him more time for less money. And then joining associations because there's so many, like I said, SBDC, like with Georgia Grown. So a lot of these farmers, and I'm a Georgia Grown member as well with Sustain Agriculture. And so it's like people want to support local, but if you're not affiliated with that marketing program for free, well, it's not, yeah, you can join for free. And then there's, there's, well, no, it's a paid most cases because they have to use the funding to support you in, uh, in that regard. So when you're in these, agricultural programs or you're in these, you know, it's like, go directly to the Department of Agriculture's commissioner, sit in his office, get immersed in it. Dude, hi, I'm paying member. You work for me. I need your support. I need your wisdom. I need to get from here to there. And these guys, they get these jobs and who knocks on their doors? So it's like, you can't be mad if you don't get frustrated enough where you just like, I can't do this. And I got to move forward. I got to take some steps. I can't just, this is painful where I'm at, you know, and I can't be like, whoa, it sucks. And boo, 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 right. Cause misery loves company. No, you have to get out of this mud, you know, step on some solid ground and say, look, I'm going to go talk to these, you know, to the department of a deputy. I'm going to reach out to all of these organizations, associations that I'm a part of, or, want to, you know, mentor me from my tax dollar or or my paid subscriptions. You know, it's like you got to push people to give you the tools and they have them, but they're not going to hand them to you. You know, it's like you have to come in here and you have to you have to show up and you have to create this relationship with me and then I have to trust you. And then once I'm trusting you, I say, oh, I might be able to refer you. Right. Because no one refers for the purpose of calling me back on you sent that guy here. I had a higher regard for you than that. And you're like, oh, what happened? Well, next time I'm not going to say it. You know, so it's like, you know, you got to get into these clicks. You got to get into these circles. People protect their reputations. They build their reputations and they're not going to just trust you going to not wreck them. So what assurances do I have? You're not going to just be a wrecking ball. Right. And my good idea of a deed to help you turned out to be something that ruined my reputation. That goes back really to your early days in the customer service world of the tourism. You said it previously, like if somebody recommends you for something, right, you have to be true to your word. You have to follow through and never like drop the ball. And I think that that's something that's so hard and that's so much accountability for someone starting something, but that's what separates you from everyone else. And people invest in you and you're absolutely right in that. And so, gosh, you're just like providing so much. I'm a guy without a high school diploma. I'm a guy who didn't even finish high school because teachers told me why, what's the point? And I was so knowing, like, whatever. Yeah, I guess you're right. And one teacher chewed me out. She actually was in the shadow of it all. Again, one of those people and followed me unbeknownst to me to the principal's office, sat outside after I left the office, then stopped me and asked me what happened. And I was like, well, this happened. She says, you ever let anybody do that to you again? Don't you ever let anybody tell you to quit? And I was like, wow, but I didn't know she was doing that. So at the end of the day, it's like, you know, 
you have to do your part. You got to get out there. If you're if, if you're serious about it, then you got to see the end game. You can't just be like, well, well, yeah, it's hard, but there's a lesser heart in every situation. And you got to be savvier than when you started. And you got to have better circles than when you start. See, a lot of people think they're not linked decisions, but you're only as good as the five people you hang around. So you can't go, well, I'm going to be successful, but I hang around unsuccessful people. I mean, you can't, you know, you can't make this stuff up. Like you can't just, and people are like, well, how come you got what you have? And I don't, how come this and this and how, you know, I'm just using this, you know, weird terminology, but it, this type of thinking is the stuff that keeps you back. Because for me, my attitude is when I'm driving down the street, I've always looked out a window and saw a better car than mine and gave him a thumbs up. I just did because I wanted to see his reaction. And he'd be like, yeah, yeah, you see it. Huh? I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. I see it. Yeah, you, you know I see what you're doing over there. And he's like, yeah, yeah, you're going to get there. You're going to get there. But, you, know, you can't hate on it sucks. But if, you, but if you turn your attitude around and say, I want that too. Not why does that person deserve to have that too. You got to say, I want that and I'll do what it takes to get it. And if he can have it, I can have it. If they can have it, I can have it. It's no different. It's just you can't look at it like it wasn't meant for you. You know, you really have to prophesize that it was meant for you. Now, I don't have all the tools that this guy probably has, but he's not better than I am. I just need to do some more work. I need to. But it's good to have a motivational thing. That's why I, I give him a thumbs up. That's why I like to drive to nicer neighborhoods and and look at the nicer homes than the ones that are in my neighborhoods or things like that. Because then you go, oh, wow, there is, there is this different thing, right? And it's not closed off to you. If you let it, then it is. If you, if you tell yourself, if you don't give yourself these affirmations, if you're not going to say, hey, I, I want to go expose myself to some cool stuff and look at some cool stuff. And then I'm not going to tell myself I'm not worthy of that, or I'm not going to let someone else tell me that I can't have that or let you shoot your ideas down before you even get them, you know, planted, you know, cultivate. So, you know, you, you have to guard yourself. You can't just let everybody just, you know, go to the bathroom on your dreams. You got to be like, okay, I'm going to get me an umbrella. I know that when we talked in Cotton Valley, we talked about specifically like the myriad of roadblocks for black entrepreneurs to navigate and in order to get products to market. And I'd love for you to speak on your experience in the food industry and also collaborating with black farmers and growers in Georgia on the systemic problems and barriers that still exist today and that really need to be rebuilt and reimagined. For me, the easiest way to do it is say, look, I'm just going to buy that land and till it. And I'm going to make some money selling my products. Well, that was too easy. And so now it's, yeah, you can buy the land, but can you grow on it? And if you wanted to grow on it, whose seeds do you have to buy? I mean, you took something Mother Earth made with dirt, took some seeds that, from trees that are already here, and then you go, well, you don't have permission, or you don't have, or you can't. So you made this casino where you have to have money to play and we'll take all your money, but there's no guarantees you'll win. Well, how, how is that when I'm planting something, I'm growing it, I'm taking it to market and people need it. So at the end of the day, it's like, that's, that's the nutshell in itself because they've pushed the black farmer out of the equation to become a purchaser instead of a grower. Then you created this monstrosity of growers that now make you a minority to even being a part of the process because now you don't meet anyone's cookie cut mold. You can't supply this large thing. And so you can't really, you know, there's no programs for you on the small thing, but good luck. Thanks for trying. And so I've met with farmers and I'm, I have listened to their challenges from meat side to veggie side. And this is what my conversation with the commissioner was about. And it was, you know, listening to their concerns. You have a manufacturer. You have, you have folks that are, are not able to succeed because of this Cisco's and these major Reinhardt's and these major conglomerates that go around buying 10 cents on the dollar and then devalue, you know, your situation and then charge you to even market their stuff they're buying on the penny. So they're looking at you as a commodity pricing, but you're not the commodity price because you actually the grower. 
you're not just a container of product, you know? And so, you know, a lot of them choose to opt out. And so they're stuck with this mar- this situation where they can't really produce to a level to compete. And they really don't have the commitment from the community to buy their crops or their products go on, on you know, unreally able to sell or spoil or they can't reinvent themselves because of their classification. So in other words, I'm coming to and I'm saying, listen, because we're a food company, we can say, why don't we process that into prepared meals? Why don't you take that back to market, right? So it's like the lemon and lemonade story, right? So mm-hmm. it's like when you get lemons, you make lemonade. So sometimes you got to say, well, how can I look at my food or how can I look at my stuff and put it back out? It's like... It's overly used, but it's like in order for systemic changes to happen, you have to like infiltrate into the system and like have it, you know, like have those things start to see like, oh, this can be possible. Here's a pathway through the systems that exist right now. And let's like make this change because this is broken. Yeah. And it is what it is. You know, it's it's just it, it was designed that way. It was one would say it's the last piece of one of the larger pieces left of segregated situations in this country is agriculture. So at the end of the day, it's a hard, complex situation. It's, it's systemically rooted in some, you know, historic racism there. So and the USDA is the problem more so than, the F, you know, the local affiliates where they get funded to make sure the mill keeps running. So, you know, it starts at the top, you know, but it get you get caught up in the, the whitewash and in the local level and at this that you don't look up. You, you know, you're too busy not trying to get slammed to the ground to pay attention to where the real traffic is coming from and it's coming from the top. So it's it starts at the very top. And honestly, in all of my experiences, I mean, I probably toured like 150 farms at this point. And the ones that specialize, just like you've gone through all the steps and it's just, it's so nice. The ones that like you do everything first, right? You're throwing stuff at the wall and then you see what sticks and then you specialize and then you like create something out of that product that adds more value to it. You know, maybe you reach a point where like, then you're able to prop up your friends, your other farmers, the small scale farmers that are also growing like, hey, you know, I know that like you sell at the farmer's market, but would you grow like two beds of carrots for me? Because I'm going to need that for my product. It's like that from the bird's eye view, it seems so simple. But sometimes when you're stuck in the weeds, it's really hard to see how you can like form that community, build that strength and foundation from the ground up. You have like just shared so much wisdom with me today and so much has resonated with me in my own entrepreneurial journey. And it's just really nice to talk to other people that work for themselves because I feel like there's this, there's almost a level of trauma that comes with entrepreneurship because you're just constantly having to think out of new ways. And sometimes this just goes in the wrong direction. And it's just like, it's nice to commiserate and to also just like see other people on their journey and their path. And I think for anybody that's new and is, is starting something new, it's just nice to like hear that they aren't alone in those thoughts that you constantly have of like, is this right? Like, what do I need to do? Like, what are these roadblocks that I have to work around? I just really appreciate you as a human being too. And that your entrepreneurial journey is really like focused on service and community building as well. And so I'd love to know like what those two things mean to you and how you see them as being intertwined in your life and purpose. I don't think you can have one without the other, really. They go hand in hand. I think food is a fellowship really for me. People always love gathering in the kitchen. People always love to, probably more so than the dining room, right? It's like stand, nosh, talk, lean. People are always in the kitchen at a party. Always in the kitchen, right? <laughs> but, and if the food is like good, or the, the culture is there and everything, it's like all the stress goes away. You're just like, ah, oh, you know, this is nice. I wish life day could be like this every day, right? So you stay in the kitchen. And the same thing in the community, when you're doing something to help folks who are not in need of a handout, but a hand up, right? And it's like, we just have to, they're they're one and the same, you know? And when you bring those two together, 
you have a powerful thing because you're feeding souls and you're also uplifting in the same time. And so people have an opportunity to see the neutrality in that and see that, you know, you have two legs, two hands, two feet. I have the same thing. So we're all just like the same, right? Essentially better off in some cases, not so much in some other cases, but at the end of the day, it presents opportunity, right? Because it's exposure. It's all about exposure. It's about what you didn't know because you don't know what you know until you know it. So it's about as much exposure as you can have, knowing that you're doing something for someone and you don't want anything out of it. You're just doing it because it's, it just feels like the right thing to do, right? You know, people have helped me and that's what community is in a sense. Community is those that helped you but didn't stop to tell you they did. And I also feel like just as a business owner, you talked about it a little bit, that idea of work-life balance, right? And like making sure that you make time to take care of yourself, to nurture your family. It's so hard to have it all, this idea of like having it all and kind of in you know, our capitalist systems of like bigger, bigger, grow, 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 like that isn't actually sustainable. So I'm wondering, you know, I feel like you're very mindful of that. And I'm wondering how you kind of have like factored those into the equation of like growing your business in a way that feels sustainable and doesn't get too big. The thing about it is, yeah, you know, the mindfulness of of, of it all for me is that nothing tells you the truth faster than your body. You know, it's the reality. Like you said earlier. So, you know, I look for the gym to do, to, to keep me grounded in what's reality for me, what I can do and can't do, should do, shouldn't do, moderation, so forth. And the same thing goes with the business, right? Because I can't tell my business how big to get or how small to get. Because in most cases, when you start a business and if your situation is to tell you, oh, I'm tired of this. I want to go small again. You pretty much are going to die. Okay. There's no, I'm going back to my infancy. You can't, there's not, there's there's no place for you there anymore. So the business is its own, as I said, the E-Myth is its own living, dying organ. It has no bearing on you as a person. It is a living, dying thing. If it lives, it lives. If it dies, it dies. doesn't mean that's who you are. It just means that's what happened. And so a lot of times we intertwine ourselves between that and our business, like our kids or whatever, if you have children and you say, well, I'm living vicariously to my kid, or if my kid fails, I failed, or he better live up to what I did or didn't, you know? So at the end of the day, it's like, no, no, that's you and that's them. And they're different, you know? So moving the business forward is difficult, like you said, because we're in this environment where you have to be a monster. You have to grow. You have to just, you know, gobble, 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 you know, be that Pac-Man. But you can you can do that responsibly, but you can't tell yourself how small you're going to be because your market tells you that. And if you tell your market something like that, then you've already put yourself out of business because you're not in your business for yourself. You're in your business for your market. So, so the balance in that is just understanding how to scale. And, and that just comes with being in the right settings to ask those questions, having the right advisors to present those questions to, because the only thing you do when you don't plan is plan to fail. Work smarter, not harder. Prioritize your life because your market, in some ways, that'll dictate how large you get too, right? Right. (laughs) It's like creating an ecosystem of like, all right, here's what's sustainable for me right now. And then the market's there. And then if it starts to get too big, like that's when you bring in people that can help you adapt. Yeah. Or know when to bring them in, you know, exactly. As you just mentioned, but yeah, that, that is a huge part. Yeah. And and, yeah. And it's, and it's, and it's, it's not easy. Just get it. And if you don't have all these Coca-Cola divisions and you don't have a guy that you get to do this and the girl, you get to do that. And, you know, I don't handle that. And she handles this. And, and sometimes that's really what gets you because you wearing too many hats. You know, my wife used to tell me and I used to be like, what? She like, you know, you you think what you do is easy and you think that it's easy for people to do. But what you do isn't easy. And I'm and that's maybe some arrogance there. But I'm like, if I can do it, anybody can do it. But maybe that's the worst of all. 
to think that way because in in most cases, you know, when you're creating, I don't think the, you know, Galileo or Da Vinci or these guys who's doing this thought that I'm better than anybody. They just thought what they're doing was great. And so they just did what they did, you know? So when you create something, you're kind of a pioneer, but I guess lack of arrogance or humility has you where that could be a blind side for you because you discount what exactly you're doing and then you devalue the real talents that it takes to do it. You got to give yourself some some pats on the back because no one else will. Oh my gosh. I feel like I'm having a mentorship session and also an <laughs> interview at the same time. I'm just like, oh, I just feel so great hearing all of these things. They're like, they're like kind of affirmations, but also just really great guidance. You can tell that all of the words of encouragement and advice that you've received along your journey stuck with you and that you are now passing that on to others. And so I just, I like, I could speak to you forever, but I've taken so much of your time. So I have two more questions for you. The first question is what's on the horizon for Brooks Made Gourmet Foods? What are your goals that you're working towards right now? And what do you hope to accomplish in the coming years? And where can people find you and buy your products? And I hope someday that you will have your products on the Urban Exodus store as we start to get that underway because they're great. And I totally believe in what you're doing and who you are as a person, like you said. So go ahead. Tell me about that. Hey, we're going to be, we're going to, we're going to make, we're going to work with you for sure. <laughs> you know that, our goals are, you know, we want to get our product. We're a global company now. We'd like to be a household name. You know, we'd like to be just as known as Hunts or Heinz or, you know, any other company that sells food, you know and collaborate and, and work work in the communities that we're in. The goals for me is just to, to bring value as well, to really have, you know, not just a CPG company to just, you know, out for profit, but to lend value to those communities that we we take fr- we take from or grow from or, you know, or grow with, you know, with their programs and things like that, because that's when you're invested in the community that invests in you. So those are the things that are kind of tied to my my business endeavors. And, you know, to see that happen within the next five years would be great. So, you know, really making as many moves as I can to create the right relationships to make that process go a lot smoother. And so we're, we're looking to partner with local grocers and grocery stores. And like my cousin and her and my aunt's restaurant, our store now, Bernice's. So it's about, you know, creating those those relationships, I like to do those a lot here in Georgia and Cotton Valley. And so that that's that's my goal for the company is to p- kind of steer the ship, you know, to a direction where we can actually be in the right place. You know, not necessarily if we're big and huge and all that as much as that we're valued in the communities that we actually are in. People can find our stuff on our, our we're, we're just been put on Amazon so you can find us on Amazon now, Brooks Made Foods, and we're, we're, we're adding more products as we speak. You can find us on our website. You can Google Brooks Made Gourmet Foods. But more importantly to that endeavor, if, if someone says it's not in my grocery store, reach out to us. If someone says it's not in my community, just send us an email, you know, and tell us where you'd like to see it. In your preliminary interview, your advice on how to move through life is, and my producer wrote it down. And like when I read it, I just felt like it encapsulated you. Be humble, appreciate the magnitude of the world and choose to be positive. And it really gave me goosebumps when I heard it. And I wondered if you had any closing thoughts or words of wisdom to my listeners on ways that they can move through life with purpose and intention. Walk the walk. Do what you say you're going to do. If you're going to feed the community or you want to volunteer, volunteer. Don't make it one of those things that you say you're going to do, but you never get around to it, right? It's like, yeah, you have to be purposeful in that regard. It wouldn't just happen. You have to carry yourself through. Hold yourself accountable, as I said earlier. You know, you yourself are your best truth teller, right? So it's, it's like, you know, you remember what people say But you also, more importantly, remember what they do. Thank you again, Walter, for joining us on the show. 
Wow, isn't he an incredible human being? Some of my key takeaways from this episode is that you can be your own worst enemy, but you can also be your own best friend. And it's really important to check in with yourself through the process and make sure that you're nurturing yourself along with nurturing your business, because otherwise you can just get lost in the process of trying to build and find solutions. And so you always have to keep checking back in with yourself. Another takeaway is keeping yourself accountable. That is the key to consistency and success. Just always checking in with yourself and making sure that you follow through with what you say you're going to do. Another real key takeaway, and I think it really embodies who Walter is as a person, is being of service to others is the ultimate benchmark for success and achievement. Taking a step back, looking at what you've achieved and figuring out ways that you can plug yourself back into your community or even take what you've made and just help others through the services that you provide. That really, at the end of the day, is the feather in the cap for any entrepreneur. Another key takeaway is being kind, hardworking, and accountable can get you really far in life. You also have to be able to tell other people what your ideas are and be excited about those ideas and sell yourself a little bit because nobody else is going to believe in you unless you believe in yourself. The final takeaway is never underestimate the value of a good mentor and friends who will tell you what you need to hear instead of what you want to hear. Finding those people that believe in you and your ideas and asking them to help you and then preparing for those meetings and those interactions so you aren't wasting their time so that they know that they're giving to you and that you are respectful of the time that they are giving to you. And lastly, in Walter's own words, Every time I hear this, I get goosebumps. Be humble, appreciate the magnitude of the world, and choose to be positive. Hi, friends. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of the Urban Exodus podcast. This project is made possible by listener support. I do this work because the people I meet through this project give me hope for the future. And I think we could all use a little more motivation and inspiration in this current moment in history. All of the work that I do through this project is to encourage people to believe in themselves and to work towards a better future for their community and for our planet. Your continued support will keep this passion project running. The easiest way to contribute is to click the support button on the top of urbanexodus.com and pledge any amount that you like. Or you can buy an ad spot in an upcoming episode, shop our online store of rurally made goods, or join our Patreon community for access to bonus features, rapid fire interviews with podcast guests, videos, live presentations, and so much more. Visit patreon.com slash urbanexodus. Another way to support is by giving us a five-star rating on iTunes and recommending Urban Exodus to your friends. Thank you again for helping me continue to do this work. I couldn't do this without all of you. You can find Urban Exodus on Instagram and Facebook at The Urban Exodus. To read more in-depth features on folks who ditched the city and went country, visit urbanexodus.com. Until next time, I'm Alyssa Hessler, and this is The Urban Exodus. Thank you.